Revelation chapter 8, roughly page 1204 in the scriptures. Every week we get people who ask, hey, Bear, what copy of the Bible is that? It is this. It says the scriptures on the front of it. You can get it at isr-messianic.org or you can go to grindstoneministries.com, grindstoneministries.com and either purchase a copy or request a copy for free if you can't afford one. And I've said a thousand times, but apparently I need to say it a thousand times more. I have, I believe it's 15 different translations of the Bible now. This is my EDC Bible. This is the one that I carry around and take copious amounts of notes in. I, yes, I'm a right in my Bible person. So you use whatever translation you want to use. I like this one for everyday carry of the Word of God. All right. Revelation chapter 8. And when he, Yeshua, opened the seventh seal. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. How do we get up to seal number 7? Well, don't you remember? Don't you know? Revelation chapter 6 was seals 1 through 6. And then there was this pause in Revelation 7 where these four messengers are standing at the corner of the earth holding the four winds which are about to blow on the earth. And Yah is like, hey man, uh, remember that harm not the oil and the wine thing? Hold on, I gotta seal some of my people in their foreheads. And John is witnessing all of this and we sealed... 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes other than Dan, but we did seal 12,000, or Yah sealed 12,000 from uh, Levi for 144,000 sealed out of the Hebrew tribes. And then there were so many out of the nations and tribes and peoples and tongues that they couldn't be counted. And then some of the elders were standing there like looking at John like, bro, who are these people? And John's like... I don't know. Who are these people? And he's like, who are these dressed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Master, you know. And he said to me, these are those coming out of the great distress, having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Right. And so we talked about all that last week in Revelation chapter 7. And now we're in chapter 8 and we're ready to open the seventh seal. And a seal would have been a scroll kind of rolled up like this. And when you tear it open... You can't leave one or two or five seals intact if there's seven seals on it and open it. Like, all seven seals have to be broken in order to open this scroll. So the last seal here, the seventh seal, eight. And when he, Yeshua, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, opened the seventh seal. Remember, John was going on like, who's worthy to open this seal? And, you know... Um, in Revelation chapter 5, he's kind of like beside himself. Like, nobody, nobody can open this seal. And it's like, turns out, yeah, Yeshua can, because he is incredible. So, Yeshua's opening the seventh seal. There came to be silence in the heaven for about half an hour. What does that mean? I don't know. I think it means about half an hour. Because there's great amount of specificity in some places in the word and in other places there's a bit of vagary but I'm a biblical literalist it, what does it say that's what it means it means about a half an hour <clears throat> so and even when we're reading something incredibly visual and prophetic in nature like revelation clearly some of the things in here can't be taken Literally, John's doing the best that he can to describe it, what he's seeing. Describe what he's seeing that's taking place in the future that he doesn't have any context for. Because he's like a Jewish guy from way back in the day. And he's like, oh my gosh, you know, tanks and planes and bombs and guns and explosions and, you know, technology probably. And like, he can only describe it the way he can describe it with the words that he has. He doesn't have a point of reference for it. But we should still, as much as we can take it literally, take it literally. Because if you start taking poetic license with the Father's word, sooner or later you're dancing on the doorstep of heresy. And the Father hates that and turns those people into bird food. Uh, he destroys them utterly. In fact, we just read 
in Isaiah 36 and 37 that um, the king of Ashur, the Assyrians, mocked Yah to his face. And Hezekiah cries out to Yah, and he's like, would you, like, literally, he presents him, presents Yah, Hezekiah, the king of Judah, presents Yah with the letter from the uh, king of Ashur. And he's like, you're going to let this guy say this stuff? And Yah's like, nope, 185,000 dead. So, you don't want to be dancing on the doorstep of heresy. So, take as much literally as you can is my point here. So when it says, uh, oh, good, we're what, nine? No, only six minutes in, one verse. When it says about a half an hour, what does that mean? I believe the answer is, biblically speaking, about a half an hour. And I saw seven messengers, seven angels, who stand before Elohim, and to them were given seven trumpets, or shofars. If they were brass trumpets, or trumpets of beaten work, like gold or silver, they'd be re uh, referred to as like a yovel like a brass horn, a metal horn. It says trumpets, these are very likely shofars. And another messenger came and stood at the slaughter place, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him that he should offer it with the prayers of all the set-apart ones upon the golden slaughter place, which was before the throne. Now, how interesting is this? We're in heaven, right? Um, to the extent that and we're not going to jump into the rabbit hole of what does the church preach heaven is versus what heaven actually is. Like, heaven is continual worship of Yah and praise of Yah. And we've seen elsewhere, crying out with a loud voice saying, Deliverance belongs to our Elohim who sits on the throne of the Lamb. And these 24 elders and the four living creatures and this great multitude of 144,000 and all the nations and tribes and tongues are falling down worshiping at the throne of Elohim. It's a cacophony of praise going on. And then heaven is quiet for a half an hour. It's almost like a hush comes over the crowd because we know what's about to happen. It's so incredibly impactful, right? And I say we, I guess, subconsciously in an inclusive nature because this, these nations and tribes and tongues that have been pulled out of the world and set aside unto Elohim, I think that's me. I think that's us, right? And so that's we. We are quiet for half an hour. Now, some of us are going to, we will have been killed. We will have died. We will have expired by the time we get to this point in prophecy. And so we'll be up there with y'all doing this stuff. Others of, others of us will be down here on the ground looking up to Yah going, please come, Lord Yeshua. Please bring your deliverance upon the world and your judgment upon the, word, the, the world, Yahuwah. Like, the time has come. Why did Sodom and Gomorrah get smoked? I mean, it was because of their unrighteousness. But Yah came down to investigate because the cries of the people had stacked up to the point where they reached him. I think we... We, the people of the book, we, the people of Yahuwah, will be crying out to Yah saying, it's time. It's time. you got to bring your judgment. It's time. But everything goes completely still and silent. Because the implications of what is about to come next is huge. And note that in this cacophony of heaven, what's happening here? They are worshiping the living Elohim. And there's essentially temple service going on here. That was nailed to the cross. Somebody should go up there and tell Yah, tell Yeshua, like, hey, don't you know we don't do that stuff anymore because of really bad scriptural uh, interpretation, which led to doctrines and dogmas and schisms amongst men. Don't you know, God, that we don't worship the way you told us to anymore? Because here they are in heaven with a censer full of incense and the golden slaughter place before the throne. Well, in the temple, the throne was the ark, the mercy seat, right? It's the same imagery. It's the same setup. And so here's this angel holding a golden censer and much incense. In and incense represent the prayer of the people. And it's being added to, offering it with the prayers of all the set-apart ones, the saints, upon the golden slaughter place, which was before the throne. Bro, they had a golden slaughter place. What do they need it for if they're not doing offerings in heaven with Elohim, with Yeshua standing there? Because Yeshua is the high priest per Hebrews chapter 8, right? Another reason why uh, Revelation is not taught in the modern church. 
because look at the, all the Old Testament imagery here. It's hard to make the argument that this is done away with if they're still doing it. And I got news for you. We're supposed to do it now, and I submit we'll be doing it when we're there as well. All right. And another messenger came and stood at the slaughter place holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him that he should offer it with the prayers of all the set-apart ones upon the golden slaughter place which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the set-apart ones went up before Elohim from the hand of the messenger, from the hand of the angel. And now, from verse 5 here through 13, and this is a short chapter, stuff is going to be coming bang, 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 bang. Hot and heavy. And the messenger took the censer and filled it with fire from the slaughter place and threw it into the earth. And there were noises and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. Think about this. This is it. You have this sensor, this thing designed to hold incense and coals, right? And he's just throwing it at the earth. And there's... Imagine you're up top, right? And your vantage point is up top and you have this thing. Call it a, a metal pail full of hot coals from a fire. And you're just throwing it down at the earth. What would that look like now? Shift perspective down here to earth. This, this is this fire brimstone raining down, right? And so these are those prayers that have cried out to Yah. Hey, let your, let your will be done, Father. Bring your day of judgment. Like, how long can we continue to endure? Like, we, we need you because your word will not return to you void. You are righteous and right ruling. You need to judge these nations. It's time. Basically, if you could put two words to it, it's time, Father Yah, it's time. And so now, all of this, these prayers and this incense and these hot coals from the slaughter place, the, which is where they burnt the incense, is being thrown down to earth by this angel. And we have a lot of Matthew 24 imagery here. And there were noises and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. And we've read Matthew 24 together before, but if you haven't, you should. Um, and there's a really, imp well, we'll read it again because there's a really important line in verse 12 that I want to hit. 24.3, Matthew 24.3, and he, Yeshua, and as, and as he, Yeshua, sat on the Mount of Olives, the taught ones came to him separately, saying, Say to us, when shall this be, and what is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Yeshua answering said to them, Take heed that no one leads you astray. So let's start with that first. First of all, if we're going to discuss the end of the age, take heed that no one leads you astray. That's the first directive here. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they shall lead many astray. Mm-hmm. And they're not. We already talked about the Antichrist, which was the first seal, the white horse. And many, I think there's many who will come claiming the name of Messiah who will not be of Messiah as well. They will be of that lawless Antichrist claiming, believing that they're covered by the blood of the Lamb. And actually they're just completely in false worship. For many shall come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and they shall lead many astray. And you shall begin to hear of fightings and reports of fightings, or wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for these have to take place, but the end is not yet. Well, remember, we talked about in Revelation 6, the removing, the second horse that goes out, removes the shalom, removes the peace from the earth. Yeah, that's going to create wars and rumors of wars. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means like people group versus people group. Like the uh, Palestinians versus the Israelis, or the. It can go as far as race wars, honestly. For nation shall rise against nation, people group, ethnos against ethnos, and kingdom against kingdom. These are like nation states, right? And there shall be scarcities of food. Yeah, we saw that. Famine, right? The third horse that goes out. And deadly diseases, the pale horse. 
right? Or the chartreuse horse or the green horse and deadly diseases and earthquakes in places. And all these are the beginning of the birth pains, right? And so if we flip back over here, keep a finger in Matthew 24, we flip back over here to Revelation chapter 8, right? All this is just beginning, just with the opening of the seals. We haven't even read the scroll yet. This is just what we're going through to open the scroll and read the scroll to get to this point. All this stuff is going down. And we see here, and there were noises and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake in Revelation 8, verse 5. Now go back to Matthew 24. And all these are the beginning of the birth pains. And they shall deliver you up to affliction and kill you. And you shall be hated by all nations for, not, for my name's sake. Yep. And then many shall stumble, and shall deliver up one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise up and lead many astray. This is, listen to this. And because of the increase in lawlessness. Hello, random dog that I've never met before. I'm reading the Bible. Go away. And because of the increase in lawlessness, the love of many shall become cold. And because of the what? The increase in what? The increase in lawlessness? The love of many shall become cold. But he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. Now, what does endurance look like? How about Revelation 14 verse 12? Here is the endurance of the set-apart ones, the saints. Here are those guarding the commands of Elohim and the belief of Yeshua Messiah. That's an interesting juxtaposition against the love of lawlessness. I'm sorry, because of the increase in lawlessness, the love of many shall become cold. So there's those who are keeping the commands and have a testimony of Yeshua who are enduring to the end. And then there's those who are increasing in lawlessness. I ain't going to make it. And this is all from the New Testament, by the way. Lawlessness is sin. 1 John 3, verse 4. Sin is lawlessness, and all who do sin do lawlessness. New Testament. Look it up. 1 John 3, verse 4. All right, back to Revelation chapter 8. So all this bad stuff reminiscent of Matthew chapter 5 is going on with the opening of this seventh seal. And this angel, this messenger, has thrown this, these hot coals and this incense down to earth. And it's causing chaos. And the messenger took the censer and filled it with fire from the slaughter place and threw it to the earth. And there were noises and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake. Verse 6. And the seven messengers who held the seven trumpets, the shofars, prepared themselves to sound. So they're getting ready to blow these shofars. Remember, it's quiet in heaven, right? And the first messenger sounded his shofar. And there came to be hail and fire mixed with blood. And they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. And the second messenger sounded, and what looked like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. What does this mean, Bear? I think it literally means that. Fire and hail and blood are going to be thrown into the earth. And when that happens, a third of the trees are going to burnt up, be burnt up, and all the green grass is going to be burnt up. What will our animals eat? Don't know. Guess you better put food in buckets. And the second messenger sounded, and what looked like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. What does that mean? I think literally that. That's what it literally says. And it shouldn't be a far leap for us to be biblical literalists. How many people do you know that are Second Amendment advocates, that are constitutional literalists? What does it say? Shall not be infringed. That's what it means. Agreed. Agreed. What does this say? And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. That's what it means. Agreed. 
And the third messenger sounded, and a great star fell from the heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the mountains of, and on the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. And we're going to pause here momentarily at verse 10 and 11. Wormwood. Is this a meteorite? Is this a comet? Is it... I, I don't know. And I've done a good bit of research on this, and I can't find anybody who I think really knows either. But it is a heavenly body falling to earth. Now, in other places, we see stars, uh, biblically and extra-biblically, in the non-canonical texts, stars being angels. Is this a fallen angel falling to earth? Is this an actual heavenly body? I don't know. Burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers. And it, it sounds like something making passing, uh, you know, into low earth ar- orbit, and burning up when it does. What does wormwood mean? It means bitter. And this particular judgment here, why? Why is this happening? Well, it turns out this word wormwood is only used once in the New Testament, right here in Revelation chapter 8. But it's used, I think, eight or nine times in the Old Testament. And I want to look a little bit, big, you know, because even though all that stuff was done away with and it doesn't matter anymore and we don't, the old OT doesn't matter, right? Uh, oops, wrong. They're intimately connected, the Old Testament and the New Testament. can't have one without the other. You can't have the Messiah that you have in the New Testament without the prophecies of the Old Testament. So you probably should quit throwing away the Old Testament. Let's look at a little bit of context in the Old Testament for Wormwood. Deuteronomy 29, verse 18. Yes, you should flip there. Can't flip there, bear. I'm driving. Well, you should flip there later when you're not driving because uh, you don't have my permission to subcontract your faith to me. Just so we're on the same page here. I'm your brother, not your pastor or your rabbi. You need to do the work yourself. Deuteronomy 29, verse 18. Remember, wormwood. We're, we're examining what is wormwood and the context around the use of the word wormwood. Deuteronomy 29, 18. Lest there should be among you a man or a woman. So check this out. We'll start at uh, 12. So that you should enter into covenant with Yahuwah your Elohim and into his oath, which Yahuwah your Elohim makes with you today, in order to establish you today as a people for himself and he himself to be your Elohim, as he has spoken to you and as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And not with you alone I am making this covenant and this oath, but with him who stands here with us today before Yahuwah our Elohim, as well as him who is not with us here today. So in context, this is us. This is not this covenant and this oath is not just with the children of Israel who were present, but all the followers, the servants of Elohim who come after that. For you know how we dwelt in the land of Mitzrayim and how we passed through the nations which you passed through, and you saw their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were with them. Lest there should be among you a man or a woman or a clan or a tribe whose heart turns away today from Yahuwah or Elohim to go and serve the mighty ones of these nations, lest there should be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. So wormwood here is in context of bitterness for idolatry and abominations and not serving Elohim and falling outside the boundaries of his covenant and his oath in Deuteronomy 29. That's some pretty good context for wormwood. I wonder if there's some consistency here. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 5. Listen, we're pros. We don't need the amateur verbs. We need the proverbs. Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5 is about the church, air quote. And so in context of that, Proverbs chapter 5, 3 through 5. 
For the lips of a strange woman drip honey. The woman is the church, a strange woman, false worship. For the lips of a strange woman, false worship, drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood. Sharp as a two-edged sword, her feet go down to death, and her steps lay a hold of Sheol, or hell, or the place of the dead. So, bitterness and wormwood here, in context of Proverbs chapter 5, is false worship. Kind of like the abominations and idolatry that we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 29. How about a couple more witnesses? Let's go to Amos. I'll give you a page number when I find it. It's back over here. Zechariah, Amos. We are going to Amos chapter 5 first. 5 verse 7, which is page 613. O you who are turning right ruling, justice, righteousness, to wormwood, and have cast down righteousness to the earth. Yeah. Seek Yahuwah and live, lest he break out like fire upon the house of Joseph, and shall consume it with no one to quench it in Bethel. O you who are turning right ruling, justice, to wormwood, bitterness, and have cast down righteousness to earth. So there's a clear juxtaposition here between seek Yahuwah and live, and O you who are turning right ruling to wormwood. Yeah, seek Yahuwah and live. Seems pretty important, pretty basic, pretty good prime directive. Seek Yahuwah and live. Roger that. Yes, sir. Will do. <sighs> o you who are turning right ruling to wormwood. So the antithesis of right ruling of justice is wormwood. Okay. How about another witness in Amos 6 verse 12. One page over. Do horses run on a rock? Does one plow it with oxen? For you have turned right ruling into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who are rejoicing over a matter of nothing, who say, have we not taken horns for ourselves by our own strength? Squirrel, literal. Squirrel, actual. Um, so we see here, wormwood here. You have turned right ruling into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood, into bitterness. The fruit of righteousness, the works of righteousness into bitterness. Are we seeing a pattern here? Just a couple more. Flip to Jeremiah chapter 9. Our buddy Jerry. Jeremiah chapter 9, roughly page 477. Jeremiah 9, verse 15. Therefore, thus said Yahuwah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, See, I am making this people eat wormwood and shall make them drink poisoned water. Hmm, why would he have said that? Let's go two verses up into 13. And Yahuwah said, Because they have forsaken my Torah which I set before them, and they have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it, but have walked according to their stubbornness of their own heart, and after Baals, false gods, which their fathers taught them. Thus said Yahuwah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, See, I am making this people eat wormwood, and shall make them drink poisoned water. Why? Because they have forsaken my Torah. Are we starting to see a pattern here? as to why the father would kill off a third of the people with wormwood. Last witness here, Jeremiah 23. We're already in Jeremiah, so flip forward to Jeremiah 23. 23, 15. Therefore, Thus said Yahuwah of hosts concerning the prophets, See, I am making them eat wormwood, and they and shall make them drink poisoned 
water, for defilement has gone out onto all the land from the prophets of Jerusalem. Thus said Yahweh of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They lead you astray. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of Yahuwah. They keep on saying to those who despise me, Yahuwah has said you shall have peace. And to all who walk according to their own stubbornness of their own heart, they say, No evil comes upon you. For who has stood in the council of Yahuwah and has seen or heard his word? Who has listened to his word and obeyed? See, a storm of Yahuwah shall go forth and rage, a whirling storm. It whirls on the head of the strong. The displeasure of Yahuwah shall not turn back until he has done and established the purpose of his heart. In the latter days, you shall understand it perfectly. You're starting to see a pattern here with wormwood. And a third messenger sounded, back to Revelation 8. And a great star fell from the heavens, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the river and on the fountains of the water. Burning like a torch. Interesting. Your command is a lamp, and your Torah is a light unto my feet. Burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. To say nothing of the bitter waters of Meribah in the Old Testament, where the children of Israel griped against Moshe, who was given the Torah by Yah. And the fourth messenger sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. And a third of the day did not shine likewise the night. Why do we have the sun and the moon and the stars? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. I know, from Revelation to Genesis, almost as if there's some congruency in the entirety of this book. Genesis chapter 1. Fourteen. And Elohim said, Let lights come to be in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and to let them be for signs and appointed times and for days and for years. For signs and appointed times. You don't think that this is a sign? A third of the sun was struck, and so the sun and the moon are both one third uh, less dark than they were. A third of the stars are no longer shining so that a third of them were darkened. And a third of the day did not shine. The day's a third shorter. And likewise, the night. Whoa, bro. I think you'd have to be really stupid to not realize that something serious is going on at this point. Signs and appointed times. And I looked. And I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven crying with a loud voice. Whoa, whoa, woe to those dwelling upon the earth. Because of the remaining blast of the trumpets of the three messengers who were about to sound. So here in chapter 8, we get four of the seven shofars being blown. There's still three more to be blown, which we'll read about in chapter 9. But let's go a couple more proof texts here for verse 12 with the reduction of the sun and the moon and the stars. How about Yeshiyahu, Isaiah chapter 50? That bug was in a hurry. You all hear him? Isaiah chapter 50. Yeah, 51 through 3. Thus says Yahweh. Again, why is he doing this? Why are these shofars being blown? Why are these judgments coming upon the earth? Thus says Yahuwah, Where is the certificate of your mother's divorce, divorce whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Look, you were sold for your crookedness, and your mother was put away for your transgressions. When I came, why was there no man? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Was my hand too short to ransom, or have I no power to deliver? See my rebuke, I dry up the sea, I make the rivers a wilderness, their fish stink, for there is not water, and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with darkness, and I make sackcloth 
their covering. Yeah, because of your transgressions and your whoredoms. Nice little dovetail there with what's going on in Revelation, wouldn't you think? How about Jeremiah? One more time, our buddy Jerry, chapter 4. So from Isaiah, next is Jeremiah. Or Yermiyahu, if uh, you're feeling extra Hebrew today. Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 21 through 29. How long? This is uh, Yahuwah speaking. Like keepers of a field, they are against all around, against her all around, because she has rebelled against me, declares Yahuwah. How long shall I see a banner and hear the voice of a shofar? For my people are foolish, they have not known me. They are stupid children, and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. I looked at the earth, and I saw it was formless and empty. In the heavens they had no light. And I looked at the mountains, and I saw that they shook, and all the hills were swaying. And I looked, and I saw there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. And I looked, and I saw the garden land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of Yahuwah by his burning displeasure. For thus said Yahuwah, all the earth shall be a ruin, but I shall not make a complete end. On account of this, let the earth mourn and the heavens above be dark, because I have spoken, because I have purposed, and shall not relent, nor do I turn back from it. All the city is fleeing from the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into the bushes and climb up on rocks. We saw that earlier in Revelation. All the city is forsaken, and no one is dwelling in it. And the fourth messenger sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, crying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those dwelling upon the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet, and the three messengers who are about to sound. Bless y'all. Shalom.